It is that time of the year again when we are oftentimes asked to say something that we're thankful for. And this might seem a little extreme, but year after year, I've come to expect that whenever we're gathered around the dinner table on Thanksgiving Day. And then there are times when I actually try to anticipate being asked that question. That way I come up with a decent answer. Uh, because sometimes uh, if I'm not ready, I start thinking, oh, okay, well, what am I thankful for? And then I hem haul around and so forth. And then I wonder if people thinking, well, he's not thankful for anything. You can't think of something, you know, in three seconds, that kind of a thing. But it's not the case at all. It's just there's so many things that I'm thankful for that to try to think of one thing can be a little difficult. And so I guess it's just being, uh, you know, concerned about what other people are going to think about me whenever I'm being put uh, on the spot. I mean, I can say I'm thankful for my church. I'm thankful for Jesus. I'm thankful for uh, my cat. I'm thankful for my job, all those kind of things. Now, in that list, I intentionally did not mention family there because Everybody expects you to say that you're thankful for family. That's the mature answer. And so once somebody says, oh, I'm thankful for family, well, guess what? Everybody else after, well, they think they have to say that they're thankful for family too because they don't want to be the one person who's thankful for family, family, family. Oh, this nice shirt or this new gun that I got or whatever. Even though you are thankful, it just seems a little materialistic, even though it's really not. You can be thankful for those things. It's just in comparison, I think sometimes we sort of, you know, almost ruin it for the people who come afterwards if you're the first one and everybody thinks they have to follow suit. As you can tell, I've probably put way too much thought into this, by the way, <laughs> overthinking it. But year after year, you know, I sort of, you know, took a while, but I do catch on sooner or later. And uh, again, but what I'm getting at is sometimes there are individuals who have difficulty finding something that they truly are thankful for. And it's not because they're not thankful at all. It's just may, might be another reason. Have you ever been in a situation where it's just hard to focus on what you're thankful for due to all these other circumstances surrounding your life, things that you're dealing with? Uh, could be the uh, case for somebody here this morning, too. And this is just the message that was laid on my heart this morning to share with you. And if that's not you, if you're some right now, if things are going pretty well for you in life and you know I can tell you 10 things in a minute that I'm thankful for, that's great. But it is helpful to understand that for you, the holidays might be a very joyous time, but maybe for somebody else, it's not so much the case maybe this year. Maybe it hasn't been very joyous for quite some time. So we need to understand that people are coming from different backgrounds and perspectives and so forth. But before we get too far into this, I want to read the short passage of the words of Jesus that I hope will give you some inspiration and guidance about how to deal with the difficult times in life, uh, especially around the holidays like uh, we are here this week. It is in the Matthew chapter 11, the very last three verses of that chapter from 28 through 30 in your pew Bible, it's page 689. And we'll read from Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. May the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and hearing of his holy word. <coughs> My hope is that you've heard or read these verses dozens of times before, if not well over a hundred times in your Christian walk before. And in this uh, small passage, uh, we need to realize Jesus knew the Old Testament scriptures extremely well. Okay, that goes without saying. And it seems here that although he's not quoting directly from the Old Testament, it seems very likely that he is referring to a verse back in the book of Jeremiah, actually. Uh, chapter 6, Jeremiah, it says, 
Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. Now this rest for your souls, that's the common link between Jeremiah and Matthew in the words of Jesus. Back in Jeremiah, the people of the nation of Judah, they had to be reminded that they would be better off if they would learn from their ancestors and remember the good things that they did and copy or emulate those things rather than do it their own way. Sometimes people think, oh, well, people who came before me, they're just old fashioned and think times have changed and so forth. It wasn't any different back in Jeremiah's day, which was a very, very long time ago. And we know that uh, some people have that same sentiment even today. But uh, the very next line in Jeremiah is very sad. After saying you would be good to copy the good things, he says, but you said we will not walk in it. Basically, we're going to do our own thing. We're going to go our own way. And in that case, the people of Judah, they were at a crossroads in their lives. They had to decide what the proper course of action was. Whereas they could have looked at the ones who came before and acted equally as wise. Sadly, they chose what was expedient, what was easy, and they here and now. And they did that instead. Uh, not a very wise thing to do, by the way. So the prophet told them if they were wise, then they would be led towards what they should do. And it would ease their minds and it would give them rest. And I think rest is really what a lot of us need, especially around this time of the year. Rest is what we need to uh, get rest from the hustle and bustle of this upcoming season. Rest from stress rest from tough situations, even rest from sorrow and grief. In life, we find ourselves in tough situations. Some of those situations, if we're being honest, are of our own making, while other situations, things just sort of happen and we have to react to them. We live in a day and an age where a lot of people on the whole don't want to take responsibility for their decisions. Maybe they think it's just a lot easier to claim that they're a victim of things that happen. But sometimes we do actually admit that we messed up. And there are, I'm sure, still a few of those honest souls out there. And I'm reminded of a cartoon where a man asks a woman what her greatest weakness is, and she says, honesty. And that he, taken, he is taken aback by that. And he says, really? I don't think that honesty is a bad thing. How can that be a weakness? And in all honesty, she says, I don't really care what you think. <laughs> so, but that's not the blatant, in-your-face kind of honesty that I'm really talking about this morning. It's honesty about our own faults. And we've... For instance, we've all told a lie in our lives. I'm sure we have. But have you ever told a lie that later comes up again and risks biting you if you aren't careful? And it can lead to a stressful time because at this juncture, you basically have two choices. You can admit to the first lie, which a lot of people don't like to do. Or you can do what many other people do, and that is tell lie number two to cover up lie number one. And then we find out oftentimes it leads to lie number three and four and so forth, which is why telling lies is not a good habit to get into. But the point is that sometimes situations like that can cause problems for us. And sometimes those problems are of our own making. But there could be other situations where you're just kicking yourself because you know that what you're dealing with now could have been avoided at some time in the past. And regardless of that situation, you find yourself worrying about a situation now and it robs you of the peace in your life and it robs you of the rest that you could be experiencing. Life is full of burdens. That's for sure. Like I said, some of our own making, maybe some not. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus talks about burdens. And like I said, sometimes they aren't even brought on by you. Uh, sometimes they're brought on by other people. In uh, the days of Jesus, 
Well, the Pharisees, they were very guilty of doing this to other people. They started out as a group really with the best of intentions. They saw that the Jewish people of the time were not following the scriptures. They were not living very honorable lives. So they said, we got to go back to the Bible and see what God wants of us and do our best to, uh, to um, you know, devote our lives to holy living. And it's a very, it was a very admirable beginning for them. Uh, that's not the kind of Pharisee that we see represented in Scripture, though, because history shows us that drastic holiness movements, which we should all try to be holy, but what I mean a holiness movement, this is somebody who says, I am going to live an absolute sinless life for 24 hours, okay, it's great to try to do that, but real, realize it's probably not going to happen because we are just sinful creatures by nature. Oftentimes when people start to go down that road to live a completely holy life, they go astray very quickly. Uh, for example, oh, I've made it an hour without sin. I'm pretty proud of what I've done. Well, there it goes. You know, the next, you didn't even make it very far. And things like that. And uh, another thing that often happens is it leads to what we call legalism, where you have to define the details of the law that you're trying to keep or the laws that you're trying to keep. And oftentimes it results in adding to God's law, which is not a good thing to do at all. The Pharisees were a very proud, legalistic bunch by the time that Jesus came on the scenes. And later in Matthew, Jesus says this, for they, talking about the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So Jesus had a lot to say about the Pharisees and people like them. And they created these expectations to hold over other people's heads, too. Uh, have you ever felt, or maybe do you feel now, burdened by the expectations of other people? Peer pressure is something that we don't experience only in school. I think sometimes the most difficult peer pressure we might face is in adulthood, actually. But it's odd because the church strives to change the behavior of their people really based on peer pressure. You shouldn't be getting drunk. You shouldn't be committing adultery. You shouldn't be living a life of lies and so forth because we are trying not to do it, so you shouldn't. It's a good way to use peer pressure, but the odd thing is sometimes peer pressure works the other way in the church where then sometimes we want our people to maybe uh, avoid false teachers because of uh, peer pressure too. So there's a lot of different ways that you can look at it. The Pharisees relied greatly on peer pressure, but they did so in a bad way and because they really wanted to control other people. They wanted to control the religious system of the day. Uh, take the Ten Commandments, for instance. Ten Commandments, um, if you don't have them memorized, you can probably memorize them in a day. Um, they're not that difficult. Well, the Pharisees or observed over 600 commandments, okay? That's a few more than God intended for his people. Uh, my, one of my favorite illustrations is they said, you cannot look in a mirror on Saturdays. Yeah, uh, can't make this stuff up. They wonder why this randomness, you know? Uh, there's a reason for it because Saturday was the Sabbath, so you do no work on the Sabbath. And they wanted to guard against breaking that Sabbath commandment. And they knew that if you looked in a mirror and if you saw a hair out of place, you would be tempted to fix it or comb it. But that would be work. And so we, don't, we can't be combing our hair on the Sabbath. So you can't look in a mirror to know that something is out of place. They actually did this kind of stuff and not making this up at all. You can look it up. So it's just an example of how this stuff can snowball so quickly. And some, a lot of people were really influenced by this and so they would not look in the mirror on Saturday. So that's, uh, uh, it's a burden that they laid on other people that was unnecessary. Uh, but the good news is Jesus says, if you come to him, 
You'll be freed of such control. Now, the Pharisees as an organization do not exist today anymore, but the spirit of the Pharisees never went away. It lives on even in some churches today. Some Christians do an imitation of the Pharisees when they add to God's law, just like the Pharisees did. And maybe they condemn people for doing things that they don't like. And they say, well, God wouldn't want this because this is an application of God's law in the Bible and so forth. But when you read the Bible, hmm, it's really not in there. And Paul talks greatly about the freedom of the believer, and that's a whole message for another time. The Bible does give us freedom to live lives more strict than what God gives us, but the Bible doesn't give us the freedom to impose those extra restrictions on other people. I ask you again, have you ever felt burdened by the expectations of other people? Sometimes do you even feel like you'd rather be around non-Christians than around God's own people for that same reason? Uh, relational issues can happen in the church and out of the church, in the workplace and at home and everywhere. And relational issues are some of the most difficult to get past, uh, if you haven't figured that out already. And those things can stand in the way of you feeling thankful to God for all the blessings that you do have. But you might wonder, well, what do I do if I feel burdened by something during, especially during the holiday season, how do I get past this? Well, Jesus talks about his yoke, and he urges you to take up his yoke rather than the yoke of the world that tends to pull us down. There's many things we can learn from Jesus in these three short verses. Uh, these are just a few things that help us keep centered on him when life gets out of hand. And I'll just share just a couple with you here. One is that Jesus requires us to put him first and learn from him. How do we learn from Jesus? We'll look in the Bible at the practical ways that Jesus reacted to circumstances around him. When things got hectic, he left the crowd. And then he uh, went to be by himself to pray and to be with his father. When people laughed at him, he held on to the truth. When he came, people came to him with illnesses, he had compassion on them. When his disciples left him during his last hours, he showed a forgiving spirit later on. And what speaks to me the most is when death ravaged lives of people around him, and Jesus saw people hurting, it moved him to tears too. And another thing is that Jesus doesn't have all these extra strings attached like people want to, to tie to things. What you need to know about how to be saved, it's all in the Bible there. Um, your boss at work might be moody one day and happy the next, and you don't know how he's going to feel the, the day after that. But it's not the case with God. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And in other words, he's never going to throw you a curve that takes you by surprise because the Bible's here. We can read it and know what's expected of us. And thirdly, whenever you follow Jesus, you allow him to teach you how to give up control over your life. The, the yoke won't be taken from you. Jesus says, take up my yoke, not give me your yoke. There's a difference there. But allow Jesus to bear it with you. By definition, the yoke is attended for, in, intended for two to bear at a time. That's why it's a yoke. So when Jesus offers you a yoke, he's not expecting you to take it from there and let him know how you make out. So many people, even Christians, I'm sure, live under such a burden in their lives that God never intended for them to bear by themselves. Maybe some are just stubborn. Maybe they just haven't read the Bible or don't remember what the words of Jesus say about his yoke and the offer that he makes to them to take up his yoke instead. I can tell you from personal experience that once I realized that God was willing to bear my troubles with me, it made all the difference in the world. Through the years, people have told me you never seem to worry about anything. And 
I, I won't say I never worry. There are times it creeps in there, but honestly, it's, it is pretty rare. And it's not because I'm some kind of a super Christian. Believe me, I am far from it. It's just that I trust that God has a plan that I'm not really privy to many of the details of. And I know that I'm not bearing my troubles by myself. I am yoked to Jesus. And when your eyes are open to that realization, why would you worry? You know, there's, no, there's no sense in doing that. But when you strip everything else away, I think it boils down to trust. If you trust in Jesus and bear his yoke, it frees you from bondage and from the burdens that you've been carrying. Once you shed the yoke of the world, it allows you to be thankful for the blessings of God. And I don't want to assume or make you assume that it's an easy process either. It's not a three-step program. I know that some people in this church alone have been through an awful lot this year alone. And I know that there's a lot of struggles, and that's why I'm bringing this message this morning. Some are right now in the trenches of the spiritual battle. Virtually anything can threaten the joy that you should have at the holidays. Health issues, relational issues, financial issues, employment issues, issues with your relationship with God even. And maybe you've even been touched by a serious illness or somebody in your family or a friend, and even death, of course. All of these things threaten to sap your thankfulness. The thing is that uh, dealing with, uh, the thing that you're dealing with doesn't even have to be recent, doesn't have to be this past week or this past month or this past year. Maybe somebody you know passed away quite a while ago, a year two years, five years ago, but rather than feel thankful, you just sort of can't get past focusing on that one individual who isn't with you. And you know that you should move on. You see other people, they're back, you know, moving on with their lives. And you think, well, if I say something to someone, are they going to think I'm weird? Or are they going to think uh, even worse that I'm not a good Christian because I don't feel thankful in, in November? Well, I would be no better than a Pharisee if I told you that you're a bad person for not feeling thankful because that's not the truth. It doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you a person is what it does. It's easy to stand in judgment of other people who are walking in different shoes. So the fact is that we are bearing stress or struggles and that is a yoke in and of itself. Whatever it is, Again, you don't have to bear it by yourself. You can pray to God to take away the struggle. He may be gracious to answer it, but he may choose that it is better if he doesn't take it away. Then you'll learn to lean on him and trust him even more. Maybe he sees it fit that this is a trial and a fire that you must walk through rather than deliver you from it. And while you're walking through that fire, Jesus offers you his yoke so you'll never be alone. Whereas the yoke of the world pulls you down, what does that do with your focus? You're looking at the ground in front of you. But Jesus' yoke pulls your head up because he is higher than we are. And that allows you a whole different view of what's going on. Doesn't mean you can see everything that's affecting you, but maybe you can see a way out in that circumstance. That increased vision might allow you a better glimpse of the blessings of God too. So it's about who you are yoked to and what you are focused on. So to go back to where we started, what will your demeanor be this Thursday when you're seated around the dinner table on Thanksgiving? Will you be able to focus on God's blessings? How will you respond to the question, what are you thankful for, if somebody asks you? Remember that I said sometimes I can't settle on just one thing, you know, at the spur of the moment. 
Well, I urge you, have something in mind. Okay, don't go to the extreme that I was somewhat comically trying to illustrate for you, but it should be easy to think of one thing if you are daily walking with Jesus. There's so many things that we should be thankful for every single day. Come Thanksgiving Day, we should know it right, uh, right at the moment. It's similar to the urging of the Apostle Peter when he said, always be prepared to give an answer for, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. There's no better time to be a witness to others of the hope that you have than when you're walking through the trial and when you're walking through that fire. Or as the psalmist says, through the valley of the shadow of death. And you still, despite all that, Exhibit a genuine hope in your demeanor that other people can see. So I'm going to wrap it up very soon here and say that given that there are so many different circumstances alone in our bulletins under prayer concerns, just taking those alone, uh, not to mention that I'm sure there's somebody here who's dealing with struggles and trials. And who knows who might be watching on YouTube later whenever I post this, uh, hopefully later this afternoon. Maybe somebody needs to hear this message and somebody needs to know that Jesus is willing to offer you his yoke, to walk with you. And not just that, there's a church full of believers right here in Kennedy's Valley that are willing to pray for you. That's why we put names in this prayer concerns so we can take that home during the week and pray by name uh, to God for these individuals. I'm reminded that a long time ago, the Bible tells us Elijah, he was depressed to the point where he wanted to die. He asked God to kill him and take him away. God didn't answer the prayer. And he didn't because he still had important work for him to do. So if you're here today, your work is not finished. If it were, you would be with Jesus now. And I'm not telling you something I haven't experienced either. Uh, it's a testimonial that Jesus has the power to transform your life if you take up his offer to bear the yoke with you. Because he says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He's done it for me many times. And, but when I feel pain, it still hurts. And when people die, I still cry. It doesn't change those things. None of that changes because we're still human. But uh, we receive comfort from the Lord. And in my case, I know he has helped me through it. You have the same choice that I have. You can either muddle through the difficult times by yourself Bearing the yoke of the troubles by yourself or the other option is to hold your head up because you are yoked with Jesus and you gain strength knowing every single blessing that God has poured out upon you in your life. And even at this very moment, all those blessings that you can count, even on the darkest days, you should always be able to identify a blessing from God. He's the same God who offers rest for your soul and whose yoke is easy, and whose burden is light. It's always something to give thanks for, especially if you're gathered around the table on Thanksgiving Day. Let's close now with a word of prayer.